10th Asian Licensing Conference 2021. This year, the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, HATDC, and Business Focus is jointly launching a conference series, namely the Entrepreneur Dialogue, Invent a Business with Creative Use of IPs. The series aims to inspire more to invent businesses with innovative uses of IPs and disrupt the market, hence stimulating new market demand and transforming industries which would be conductive to the economic recovery, especially in Asia. Today, we are very happy to have Ms. Astin Wing, founder and CEO of Pops Worldwide, to share her journey of entrepreneurship on the IP businesses. Esther has also been awarded by the Forbes as one of the 10 inspirational female tech entrepreneurs from SEA in 2017. Hello, Esther. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to speak. So Esther, what made you jump into the music licensing industry and founded Pops Worldwide in Vietnam in 2007? Oh, I think it was a little bit of craziness and young, foolish thinking <laughs> of, you know, I could pretty much do anything and conquer the world. Um, I was in Silicon Valley at the time and I had this grandiose idea of, hey, let's start um, the Spotify of Vietnam. And this was even before Spotify existed. This is when Facebook was just getting started back in 2007. And I looked at Vietnam as, you know, what was important to the culture of the, uh, of the country and what was important to them. Um, and it's always been music. And so I knew that there was whatever I was doing had to be about music, uh, which is what connects everyone together. Well, that's wonderful. I know that Pops Worldwide is now a leading digital media company in the Southeast Asia, not just distributing music to Vietnam. Could you tell us more about the content and market that Pops is covering today? Yeah, no, I think, you know, with music, it was a great starting point and really understanding, you know, how to license and how to educate the whole market about uh, music. But we decided why stop there and why not explore into other genres of, of content as well as other formats. And so we moved from music into entertainment, entertainment to kids, into anime, into comics, uh, webtoons um, and now into esports and not just you know looking at it from a vertical content vertical standpoint but as well as um, territory um, you know we started here in Vietnam and we created a great base here but what makes us you know why not look outside and so we moved into Thailand a few years ago and we are now very strong in leading um, in Thailand and we just launched Indonesia in September um, about, you know, a little over two months ago. Well, that's very exciting time for you guys, right? <laughs> so does yes, Pops also promote uh, Vietnamese content? Uh, we promote Vietnamese content, but we don't stop there. We actually do work with um, Thai content creators as well as um, local creators and, and KOLs or artists in Indonesia. But we also work with some of our key partners like TV Asahi or TV Tokyo in, in Japan and, and more actually. Um, Warner Media is a big uh, partner of ours. Um, and there's a long list of international partners that we work with to license and to promote their content in our territories. So Pops is definitely doing great in terms of um, providing content to the consumers. And uh, is Pops also a profit making company now? Um, I would say we are reinvesting all of our profits back into uh, the company. Uh, I think one of the big push for us, you know, be, prior to it was about how do we work to promote and create IP and distribute on other um, platforms like YouTube or, or Facebook and so forth. Um, but last year and moving forward, our big push is about going directly to the consumer. You know, we have uh, so much data to understand what people are watching, when they're watching, how long they're watching for, and what devices. And uh, we're able to really narrow down what consumers are, are interested in, how to build IP, how to build brands. And we wanted to be closer to the consumer, and so we launched our own uh, platform to, to do so. So Pops definitely has a lot of great content. Can you share with us how you monetize the media content for Pops when all the consumers nowadays are so used to free download of contents? Yeah, it was, 
It's been quite a long journey, I would have to say. You know, in 2000, I would say 2008, it was, we're scrambling to find out how we can monetize digital content. And a lot of people didn't understand what we were talking about. And we really had to create our market ourselves. And that would be in terms of finding the right target audience and how and to understand the markets themselves. So Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia, you know, we're all in the same region, Southeast Asia. However, these are three very different markets. So we had to go down and look, you know, where do they consume? How do they consume? And to follow along their habits of, you know, they're used to having free content, right? And so, you know, understanding this, and we decided to go the route of scale. You know, how do we get in front of as many eyeballs as possible, regardless of where they are around the region? And who needs scale, which are advertisers? And um, if we're able to hone down on how to get the content in front of the consumers, advertisers are there too, you know, standing side by side with us. And so we're able to really match and connect the advertisers with the right audience, leveraging content. Right, so um, working with advertisers is really important. That's right. And then also understanding that there's a lot of uh, digital platforms that are uh, using content, probably not in the right legal format. And so for us is to understand what those platforms are and how to take those content down and to really maximize on the, the creator or the IP owner and really protect their rights. Because if we can protect their rights and steer everyone to the right destination, whether it be on YouTube or on Facebook or our own platform, then brand advertisers will also want to be part of that ecosystem. And so that's what we've created, is this ecosystem between the creator or the IP owner, the brands, and Pops orchestrating this. So talking about protecting the IP owners, how do you recruit and reward the musicians, producers, and artists, or licensors per se, in distributing their music and videos? I think with Pops, we are very aggressive, um, but we are this silent tiger that comes up out of nowhere and really goes in after these parties, and we're persistent. We're very persistent on you know making sure that the IP is protected. Um, and. It's like guacamole, you hit them you know, once and they go down and they come back up. And so it's a constant game of, of uh, guacamole. And, but we're persistent and we'll continue to go after them until the market is educated enough and to understand that you know, if you want quality content, you want uh, still free available content, you can still get that, but on uh, Pops platform or Pops branded destinations. Right, so persistence is definitely very important. That's so let's right. talk about OTT. Is Pops moving into the OTT over the top service and how do you see the OTT market? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we are moving ahead quite aggressively, actually. So we've launched our, our service in uh, Vietnam. We've also launched our service in Thailand and next year Q2 will launch um, in Indonesia. I think one of the biggest differences between Pops and a lot of the other OTT players is that we are regional, but yet we are local. Um, we have three different markets with three different products. We're not a Netflix, we are not a View who has one product and they just turn the switch and you can, you know, there you have it, it's the same. Um, for us, we believe in local content for local market, local team for local market, um, because every market in Southeast Asia is so different, as I mentioned before, and we firmly believe that. And so our product is not just a you know, one-size-fit-all. It's very localized. It's very custom for the users in each market. I see that Pops pay a lot of attention to uh, consumer behavior in different parts of Asia, for example. So do you see any change in consumer behavior over the content streaming industry amid the COVID-19 pandemic? And would you say it's an opportunity or a challenge for you guys? It's both, I would have to say. You know, we are definitely one of the lucky ones where uh, COVID did not make, have such a great impact on negatively. Um, we were able to see a rise in um, viewership, uh, a rise in watch time, 
Um, and that was great. It's great for our business. And a lot of users were discovering new types of content, new formats, new titles. And I think that was very exciting from uh, a content standpoint. However, you know, COVID, we are not immune or, you know, to COVID. So we did see an impact on um, maybe say advertisement because we are not uh, dependent on users paying for the service, but advertisers to spend. And, you know, they were subjected to, you know, lower spending by consumers or they were more cautious. So they weren't advertising as often. But because, you know, everyone's now moving along and Vietnam and Thailand are doing so well in controlling the impact of COVID, uh, we weren't really, uh, we didn't see too much of a hit. That's true because everyone is staying home during COVID-19, right? So they are watching more videos, listening to more music. That's right. And so the only impact would be like, there's too many options, right? And so how do you get your piece of content in front of your target audience? You know, and so I think that's one of our strengths uh, for the past 10 years is we're able to identify who uh, is interested in what type of content and making sure that they're able to see that or discover that piece of content. So Esther, I know that you are a Vietnamese with legal educational background and Silicon Valley working experience from the U.S. So does your unique background actually assist the journey of your entrepreneurship? Yes, and you know, I would have to thank my, my dad for this. Um, you know, from university days, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I also had my dad's voice in the background, go to law school, go to law school, <laughs> right? And, um, I, you know, I didn't listen right away, of course, being as this rebellious girl, um, but eventually I did go to law school and in hindsight, I, and I recently told my dad this after years, decades, um, that it was one of the best decisions um, to go and get a, a law degree or legal background um, education because it's really been able to, um, teach me how to identify the issues, how to break down problems and how to look at it to solve um, uh, and know where, you know, how to build the business and what lines I should not cross and, you know, really have this kind of, um, I guess, uh, a ruler or a guideline, a guiding star for me um, with the legal background. So I, I, I think my father all the time, thank you <laughs> for <laughs> encouraging me to go to, to law school. So, Well, I'm sure your dad is very pleased with your achievement right now. <laughs> so before we close today's uh, discussion, so Esther, if you were to give one advice to aspire other entrepreneurs, what would it be? Oh, that's a, uh, it's a good question and one that I always mention to every entrepreneur that I meet. Um, I would say there's two things. One. Uh, is to find yourself a support system. And a support system, one is who's going to bring you up and say all the kind and nice and encouraging words because you're going to have a lot of down days. And so you want to have that person right by you. Um, also, you need to find a team, and I mean team, of mentors because you're gonna need to tap into them at one point or another, either for point financing, for advice, for um, uh, and questions that you may have during every aspect of your business or every growth stage of your business. So it's always very important to have people who have been there and done that help you guide yourself and your journey going forward. Um, secondly, I think and this is most important is persistence. I think it's super important that entrepreneurs keep going, never give up because you're going to not get it right the first time. You're going to have to try and try again. You're gonna to have to find different ways, uh, think outside the box. And so persistence is super important for you to get through all of the different challenges. You're, Cause you're not, the answer is not going to be there for you. You're, you're trying to build something new and something great. And so you have to find your way. Um, and so don't give up and entrepreneurship definitely rewards persistence. 
Yes, indeed. The journey of entrepreneurship can be lonely sometimes. So it's very important to have your mentors and your team with you. So thank you so much, Esther, for the very insightful sharing today. To those of you who are watching, if you have any question or interest to further exchange with Esther or explore business collaborations with Pops Worldwide, Esther and her team are now attending the Hong Kong International Licensing Show, which is concurrent with Asian Licensing Conference. You may ask HATDC to help connect you with Esther. Thank you so much and bye-bye. <laughs>